Welcome to Edgelution 2.0. Edgelution was originally created as an answer to the COVID-19 pandemic. When the world went remote and students lost their opportunity to be in the classroom. To help prevent students from falling behind, Edgelution filled the gap for those who didn't have Wi-Fi or technology. Edgelution has supported the community for over two years, filling the educational divide through equity and access, ensuring that all students have a fair chance to learn and succeed in life. Our host is Ms. Pia Rosa, a Bronx-born and raised educator with a heart for her community. Let's start the show. Hey everyone, I'm so glad that you can make it today. We're gonna be doing some math activities. Are you ready to do some math? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for another exciting math lesson. Grab your notebook and pencil and we will get started. Next up is some definitions you need to know to be successful. So we are deepening our conversation around equations and the steps that we take to kind of get into the, the rhythm of solving them um, when it comes to one variable. And with that said, um, the topic really of today is going to be keeping the equality. So let's remember our goal for the week is that we're going to be able to add, subtract, multiply, or divide each side of an equation by the same expression to get a new equation with the same solution. And we're gonna do that by like rewriting equations while keeping the same solutions. And again, I want you to really focus on this picture that we've been showing this week. In order for this um, guy to be successful in what he's doing, he has to maintain his balance. And you're gonna think the same thing, the same thought process when we're talking about equations. So let's get after it. Let's say Elena was solving this problem. What um, does she need to do to each side first? Well, there are a set of kind of steps that you should take in every approach when you're solving linear equations. Let's start with step one, which is to distribute. And how do I distribute when I see the, uh, the parentheses is I use multiplication. I multiply the outside term by each term that's inside the parentheses. And in this case, it will come out to be rewritten as uh, you rewrite everything with the exception of what you are distributing, which 5 times x is 5x, and then 5 times 9 is 45. So we've completed step one, and we're just methodically going to go to step two, which is to combine like terms on either side. In this case, you can't combine because there's nothing to combine on both sides. We have two separate type terms right, that are different on each side. So we'll move to step three. And what we need to do at this point is get all variables to one side and everything else to the other. And we do that using inverse operations or um, opposite operations, first starting with addition and subtraction. Because I, I am now going to move the variables to my left, that's just what my preference is. Um, so if I do what I do to one side, I have to do to the other and that eliminates my variable term on the right and then 10 minus 5 negative 10 minus 5 is negative 15 and we can't forget to remember the variable and it's going to equal the other side because now i need to move this 15 over to the right and i do that by canceling it out through inverse operation the opposite of positive 15 is negative 15 or subtract 15. what i do to one side i have to do to the other and 45 minus 15 is 30. 
right? About the 15th cancel. And I just bring down the other term that I had. And now I have negative 15 X equals 30. So I've now done all the adding and subtracting I can do. So it's now time to move to step four, where I need to undo multiplication and division solving for the variable. I have here, if you see at the bottom, I have that 15 X, all right? So how do I get rid of the X? I mean the 15, right? I will do uh, the opposite because when you have the coefficient next to the variable, that means multiplication. So I divide, divide both sides by negative 15. Negative 15 divided by negative 15 is positive one. We don't write the one in front of a variable. We know that. And then 30 divided by negative 15 is negative two. And I really just did my simplification. X is negative two. You always go back and you can check your work by substituting in the, the value of the variable that you found. In this case, it's negative two. So I wherever I see an X, I substitute it with negative two. And then it's 15, uh, negative 10 times negative two, it's positive 20 equals five times negative two plus nine is seven. So I have 35 equals 35. That is a true statement. And therefore I know that my response is correct. We continue our conversation around keeping equality and exactly how does that look when we're dealing with equations. Uh, the, week, the week's goal, right, is that we're going to be able to add, subtract, multiply, and divide each side of an equation by the same expression to get a new equation, same solution. So now we're starting to get away from concept to actually doing um, and solving four equations. And when we're rewriting equations and learning how to get to the solutions, keep this picture in mind, right? This guy's having to balance himself extremely well. If you look at his arms, they're kind of doing the opposite of each other. What you do to one side, you have to do to the other to maintain balance, to be successful. Let's take a look at this equation below. Um, we're going to follow the steps just like we did yesterday in yesterday's video. Um, this one looks a little different, right? And we'll see how that impacts uh, the steps in which we try to solve and it doesn't these same five you're going to use if you don't if a step don't apply you just strict you just move to the next in this particular case there was no need to distribute so we just cross out step one and move straight to the next one or we combine like terms on both sides of the equations well guess what can't do that either and that's okay so now we need to move to this third step which is we need to get variables on one side and everything else on the other. It doesn't matter which side you decide to move. I particularly like to move the uh, variable to a side where it's not going to be negative. And since positive 10 is larger than positive six, I'm going to move that over through inverse operations, which is the opposite, okay? So when you don't see a symbol there, or sign there, you know that it's positive. So the opposite of a positive six is to subtract six. What we do on one side, you have to do to the other. And then we get to the point where uh, these cancel out. We bring down the 12 because we haven't done anything to it yet. 10X minus six X is four X. Do not forget your variable, whatever letter that is. And then bring down the minus four or the negative four. So now I've been successful in moving all of the variables to one side. So now I need to move all of the numbers or just the constants over to a side by itself as well. And in this case, I am going to do the opposite of negative four or subtract four, right, is to add four. You add four to both sides and you get 12 plus four is 16. You bring down the four X because you haven't done anything with that. And then negative four and positive four opposite, so they cancel each other out. 
So now it looks like I've done everything in step three. Let's move over to step four, where we need to solve for our variables, right? And so really we're isolating the variable is what we're doing. And we're doing that through inverse operation. When you see a coefficient next to a variable without seeing a symbol, you don't see a plus sign, subtraction sign, division sign, it is assumed to be multiplication. And the inverse or the opposite of multiplication is division. So we will need to divide all right, each side by the coefficient that has been multiplied by the variable, which in this case is four. And so it, in this case, cancels out or one, right? Four divided by four is one. We do not write a one in front of a variable. And 16 divided by four is four. So one X, right? But we don't write the, the one. So X equals four. And so once we figure out or we've solved for a variable, we always want to go back and substitute in to see if the statement is true. So wherever we see an X in the original equation, we substitute with the four. And as we work, we go six times four plus 12 equals 10 times four minus four, which in this case is six times four is 24 plus 12 equals 10 times four, which is 40 minus four. And 24 and 16 is 36. 40 minus 4 is 36. The statement is true. So therefore, it works. That's how you know you have the correct answer. And now you're going to try. You're going to use your, this strategy to help you out with the practice problems. And as usual, good luck. I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson as much as I have. For more practice with equations with variables on both sides, please go to the link below or use your smartphone and scan the QR code. in the community that you'd like to visit? Any new places? One of the places that I'd love to visit is the library. I heard they just built one right down the street. The Bronx Edulution. We are Bronx Strong. Yay! Hi friends, it's Nicole from the Bronx Children's Museum. I hope you're having an awesome day and that you're excited to learn some fun new things. Today, we're gonna to be talking about how different animals have special body shapes and forms which help them to survive in a particular environment or habitat. So first, we're gonna read a book, then we're gonna take a look at some special Bronx animals, and then I'll show you how to do a clay activity where you get to build your own animal with its own cool forms and functions. Let's get started. Have you ever noticed how long an elephant's nose is? Or how hard a turtle's shell is? Why do you think some animals have different shaped bodies and body parts? Well, each animal is specially adapted to live in a particular environment or habitat. An adaptation is a feature of an animal's body or a behavior that helps them to survive in that particular environment or habitat. For example, fish have long oval shaped bodies which help them to swim quickly through the water. And a red tailed hawk has very light feathers and hollow bones which help it to fly through the air. Each animal has its own adaptation, which is just perfectly adapted for that environment. Let's learn more about different animals from all over the world and their adaptations by reading a book called What Do You Do With a Tail Like This? by Steve Jenkins and Robin Page. Animals use their noses, ears, tails, eyes, mouths, and feet in very different ways. See if you can guess which animal each part belongs to and how it is used. At the back of the book, you can find out more about these animals. What do you do with a nose like this? 
If you're a platypus, you use your nose to dig in the mud. If you're a hyena, you find your next meal with your nose. If you're an elephant, you use your nose to give yourself a bath. If you're a mole, you use your nose to find your way underground. If you're an alligator, you breathe through your nose while hiding in the water. What do you do with ears like these? If you're a jackrabbit, you use your ears to keep cool. If you're a bat, you see with your ears. If you're a cricket, you hear with ears that are on your knees. If you're a hippopotamus, you close your ears when you're underwater. If you're a humpback whale, you hear sounds hundreds of miles away. What do you do with a tail like this? If you're a giraffe, you brush off pesky flies with your tail. If you're a skunk, you lift your tail to warn that a stinky spray is on the way. If you're a lizard, you break off your tail to get away. If you're a scorpion, your tail can give a nasty sting. If you're a monkey, you hang from a tree by your tail. What do you do with eyes like these? If you're an eagle, you spot tiny animals from high in the air. If you're a chameleon, you look two ways at once. If you're a four-eyed fish, you look above and below the water at the same time. If you're a horned lizard, you squirt blood out of your eyes. If you're a bush baby, you use your large eyes to see clearly at night. What do you do with feet like these? If you're a chimpanzee, you feed yourself with your feet. If you're a blue-footed booby, you do a dance. If you're a water strider, you walk on water. If you're a gecko, you use your sticky feet to walk on the ceiling. If you're a mountain goat, you leap from ledge to ledge. What do you do with a mouth like this? If you're a pelican, you use your mouth as a net to scoop up fish. If you're a mosquito, you use your mouth to suck blood. If you're an egg-eating snake, you use your mouth to swallow eggs larger than your head. If you're an anteater, you capture termites with your long tongue. If you're an archer fish, you catch insects by shooting them down with a stream of water. Did you know that here in the Bronx, we have many different animals that have special body shapes which help them to live right here in our neighborhoods? Let's take a look at a few. The first animal I wanna talk about is the harbor seal. Take a look at this picture of the harbor seal. What do you notice about its body? Harbor seals have oval or bottle shaped bodies, which means that it starts out sort of narrow at the top and it gets wider toward the bottom of their body. Now, this helps the harbor seal to live in their environment, which is the ocean. Their narrow body helps them to swim quickly through the water, and they can use their wide flippers in order to help them swim and chase after fish. We have harbor seals right here in the Bronx at Orchard Beach, and if you go in the wintertime, you can see them out on the rocks. The next Bronx animal I wanna talk about is one that you've probably seen in your own neighborhood the raccoon. Now, raccoons have a very special adaptation that not many other animals have. They have five fingers on their paws. This is pretty unusual, and it helps them to survive in their environment, which is a wooded or forested area, or here in New York City, it actually includes part of our neighborhoods too. Their five fingers on their paws help them to climb trees, to dig in the ground for bugs and other things that they like to eat, to even open things like our doors and our trash can lids. 
The last Bronx animal that I want to talk about is the box turtle. Box turtles are native to New York and we can find them in our forests and near our freshwater streams and rivers. To tell us a little bit more about box turtles, we have a special guest. This is Eleanor the animal expert and Pelham the Chinese box turtle, who is a part of our collection. So Eleanor, what can you tell us about box turtles and the shape of their body and how that helps them to survive in their environment? A whole box, all turtles have hard shells, which helps them be safe from predators, but box turtles can hide completely in their shells. Yeah, that's really important for a turtle, right? To be able to tuck inside their shell for protection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the box turtles also have legs and believe it or not, scales. Mm. These legs help them swim in the water. And, and they also have claws that are important for digging and hiding in the dirt. Yeah, our turtle loves to dig in her enclosure, right? She's got a lot of dirt in there and she likes to dig in there and burrow herself inside, both to find food and to stay warm and safe. And Eleanor, what about um, the turtle's face? I noticed something a little unusual about its mouth. Yes, Pelham has a little beak, but even just a little beak is very sharp. She uses her beak for catching worms and holding them in her mouth. Mm, yeah, so most turtles are actually carnivorous, meaning that they like to eat meat. And Palomar turtle really loves worms, crickets, other bugs, sometimes even little mice. And she uses her strong beak to catch those animals, right? Well, thank you, Eleanor, so much for coming and teaching us all about box turtles. Goodbye! Now that we've learned about some different animals from around the world and from even here in the Bronx that have really cool body adaptations, we're going to sculpt our own animal out of clay. For this activity, you're going to need a clay sculpting tool. You can also use a fork, a straw, a toothpick, anything really you have around the house, and some clay. Now if you've received one of our launch boxes, you'll have all the materials you need. Otherwise, take a look around your home or your classroom and see what you can find. Now, I'm going to show you how to do the activity, and what you can do is either pause the video here and collect your materials, or wait until the video is done and then try it on your own in your classroom or your home. Before you get started, you may want to cover your workspace or use a cutting board, because clay can be a little messy. You can use any type of clay for this activity. Play-Doh, Model Magic, Air Dry Clay, or Modeling Clay. I'm going to use Modeling Clay because I like that it stays soft and I can reuse it after this project. No matter what type of clay you use, you want to first warm up your clay and get it nice and soft. Use your fingers and hands to squish, pull, flatten, and pinch the clay. Use your hands to roll it into a nice even ball. Today, I'm going to make a model of Pelham the box turtle. You can choose any animal you'd like. Just focus on which adaptations make it unique. First, I'm going to mix green and brown together because those are the colors I see on Pelham. But you can choose any color for your animal. Once your clay is nice and soft, use your fingers to shape the main part of your animal. I'm working on Pelham's shell first, which has a rounded dome shape to it. Next, I'm using smaller pieces of clay to create the legs, head, and tail of my animal. Sometimes it can be hard to stick those pieces onto the larger part of the body. In that case, you can use a pointed object, like a toothpick, to score or add lines to the parts you're going to attach. Those little lines help give your clay something to hold onto. Pelham's beak is a really important adaptation because it allows her to catch and eat her favorite food worms. So I'm using my fingers to pinch out a little beak shape on her head. Her feet are also important adaptations. Her back feet are wider, which allow her to swim, while her front feet have little claws to help her dig. I'm using a toothpick to make her claws and a straw to make little scales all over her legs. Her legs are very scaly.
Finally, I'm going to add her cute little tail. Now I can use a toothpick or other pointed material to draw in her scoots, those really big scales you see on her shell. And of course she needs little eyes. And lots more scales, because reptiles like Pelham are covered in scales. Which animal are you going to create? What are its adaptations? We can't wait to see. All right, now it's your turn to make your own clay animal at home or in your classroom. We hope you had a really great time learning all about the different animals and their body adaptations. See you next time, bye. Hey friends, unfortunately our time has come to an end, but thank you for joining me today of Bronx Edulution, a place where we can have fun while learning together. The Bronx Edulution, we are Bronx Strong.